Okay, um, time for lecture number three. We've got to open up Google Docs here. Um, day three, number two. Okay, so this should, let me get myself out of the way. Um, all right, so hopefully that's, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, so how to do research is the second lecture topic of today. You're going off to write a compare and contrast essay. Um, how do you write that essay? Well, the first thing you got to do is you've got to find the information that you're going to put in your essay. We call that research. Uh, so how do you do the research? Well, you got a topic, okay? So you, let's say you picked a topic. You picked, uh, generally speaking, um, infrastructure of the two sides in the Civil War. So how do I turn that into a paper? What kind of research can I do? Well, number one, I want to tell you, you've got to look up information on your general topic first. There's a temptation to go into it with a bias, to go into the paper thinking to yourself, hey, I know what the answer is going to be, and then try and find information that proves that answer. I guess I still got my sunglasses on. Um, don't do that. Uh, what you should do is you should go find the information in an unbiased way. Read what you, what you can, and then come to your conclusions uh, and, and what you're going to write about based on the information that you find rather than going and trying to find the information to prove what you think is true. It's much easier to do uh, you know, when, you, when you go and find the information and then prove what you know you can prove than to try and find information to prove what you think is the truth. Uh, and that's, that's how research is done. So start with that, start from that sort of standpoint. Um, so what's a good research source? Well, there's a lot of different types of sources out there. And I've made a little list here for you. Um, in a research situation, uh, one of your best sources is what we call primary documents. Now, primary documents are actual era specific documents that would have been published during the Civil War. So like Civil War newspapers, the 1860 census, uh, the Articles of Confed the Confederation, the, the Constitution of the Confederacy, you know, military dispatches, letters from Abraham Lincoln or Robert E. Lee or whatever. They're written during the time period and we know who wrote them and so we know what the bias is and stuff like that. Uh, those would be called primary documents. They're great. If you can find those and use them, um, that's, that's wonderful. Um, another great resource is books. Now, books can be written at a lot of different levels. You have books that are written, you know, at a middle school level or at a high school level or at an academic level for, like, college professors. So you want to find um, books, but you've got to think about their accuracy, and we'll get down to that uh, a little bit later. We can't use fiction books. Um, some books that are published uh, with a particular bias um, some books are more recent than other books, and so we'll, we'll think about all of those kinds of things. Uh, but books, you go, you go and you find a, a book on the Civil War, uh, Civil War history. Growing up, I had a bunch of books on the Civil War in my house because my dad loved the Civil War, uh, and he read all about it. Um, my wife Beth, her, her father was the same way. So uh, you may have some books in your house already on the Civil War, and you may be able to use some of those. Uh, journals, uh, lots of um, historical journals exist out there, academic journals, uh, with articles, scholarly um, historical articles about the Civil War. Uh, you usually can't access those very easily unless you're on a college campus, uh, but at the public library, uh, they do have a lot of electronic journals. They're, these are articles that have either been digitized or published in the digital age, and uh, you can access them through the library's uh, software. And so you can go and you can go to the reference desk and you can ask for the help of the librarian and they'll get you to some of these journals, these scholarly journals. Especially if you can find one that's on the topic of history or on the topic of the Civil War, you're guaranteed that all of the um, articles will be relevant. Whether they're actually um, about your topic or not, you know, you can usually search the database. Uh, newspapers, again, some newspapers are primary documents if they were published during the time period in question, uh, but there's also newspaper articles not infrequently um, about historical topics that you can find and maybe use. Magazines as well, uh, you can find magazine articles. Uh, you want to think about the magazine that you're reading and, uh, you know, its authenticity and things like that. Some magazines are, are sort of um, 
published for political purposes or the, the publisher has a particular agenda or bias and you want to think about that as well. Some magazines are more reliable than other magazines, but historical ar articles are published in history magazines, but also in, say, National Geographic and things like that from time to time. So um, <laughs> now you can read my text messages as I'm recording this, I guess. Oh, well. Uh, so then uh, documentaries, I, I, a lot of people don't really realize it, but documentaries are a viable source for resor research. So if you wanted to go watch, I don't know, a PBS documentary or a History Channel documentary or something like that, um, we can cite documentaries. You can do what's called a timestamp citation, um, and we'll talk about that. And that can be very useful to you as well. So you can watch a documentary, and when you get to a point where you want to quote something or paraphrase it, you can pause it and rewind it and you know, write things down the way that they need to be. And then we can uh, quote it by putting the time during the, the runtime during the video that the quote occurs. Um, you know, and so that, that works too. And then, of course, there's websites. Websites are super tricky, though, because some websites are completely unreliable. And you, just because it's on the internet and you can find it on a website doesn't mean it's a research source or something that you can use. Uh, generally speaking, if it's in print, uh, it's much more reliable as a source than if it's something that you found online. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that. In fact, that's, that's the next place we're going to go. We're going to watch a quick documentary called Evaluating Your Sources, The Crap Test. And it's right here. Um, you may have to turn the volume up. Uh, it doesn't come through as loudly as my voice. I will do my best to be quiet during it. Uh, I may pause it every now and again and talk a little bit, though. Here we go. I don't know if you can hear the kid in the background, but I'm at the wharf and uh, I'm, I'm recording the video and, and it is what it is, uh, but there's some loud children. Uh, anyway, uh, currency is important, right? If, especially if you're writing about something that, um, you know, say is, is more modern or something that's time sensitive, you're writing about science and scientific information is changing all the time. Uh, the currency of your research really, really matters. Now, if you're dealing with something more like the Civil War, which is a historical event, uh, currency is less important than some of the other elements of this test. Uh, but even so, uh, you know, there is an issue with currency in Civil War research. For example, um, you know, a lot of material that was written, especially between the 1890s and 1960, uh, has particular biases in it. Um, it's designed for a particular purpose, and uh, you w want to consider that as, as you're going through. Uh, so we're going to hopefully pause as we go through this video, and every now and again um, you'll be able to have a little bit of a discussion about um, things. But we'll start, you know, with this idea of currency. I I've sort of told you some of the things that you should watch for, but we'll pause it after each one, and you hopefully can have a bit of a discussion about it. But here we go again. changes drastically over time, like science? 
your answer to that question decides how current your sources need to be. For example, if you were writing a paper on the solar system and you got your information from a website that was last updated in 2005, you might have a section on the planet Pluto. But if your information was current, you would know that Pluto was downgraded to a dwarf planet in 2006. Next, we have reliability. What kind of information is included in the research? Pay attention to the type of information the author is providing. If you see a lot of statements that begin with, I think, or in my opinion, then you're probably dealing with a source based on a person's opinion and not facts. Also check if the author is providing data to back up their claims. Are there charts or graphs? Does the creator provide references or sources for data or quotations? Having data and quotations in an article is a good sign, but only if the site has provided sources or references. If there are no sources, then you can't be sure the information is accurate. Check at the end of the article for a list of references. They might look something like this. Sometimes the source information for an image or a chart will be underneath or next to it in tiny type. You may even see a direct link to the source in the body of the article. If you do, click on it and make sure it's legitimate. Next is... I'm going to stop there. So, reliability. Uh, let's say you're looking online for some information on the Civil War and you find a website that's got uh, information on it that you think you might want to use. How do you know if that website is reliable? Pause this video and talk about it. Let's, let's try and figure out how we think about reliability in terms of websites. source you're familiar with? Look at the URL again. Does it match the title? Usually, reputable websites will have an address that is the same as the name of the site. What does the web address end with? A site that ends in .gov is a government website, and .edu is used only for institutions of higher education, like community colleges and universities. The information found on sites that end in .gov or .edu can generally be trusted. Sites that end in .com, .net, or .org can be owned by anyone, so don't assume they're okay without verifying first. I'm going to add to this. Um, .com is commercial. That a website that ends in .com, they, they're making money. Their whole purpose is to sell you something or to sell somebody something. And so um, it makes the information suspect. I mean, if they can change the information to sell more product, then <laughs> they will. You know, there's, there's no real, um, what we're doing, they're, they're not held to a standard uh, like some of the other uh, endings. .NET is just sort of a catch-all, and anybody can be anything with a .NET, so it, it tells you nothing about the authenticity of your source. And .org says it's a nonprofit organization, which sounds great. You're like, hey, it's a nonprofit, and sometimes that's true, but a lot of nonprofits are political organizations that have a political viewpoint, and they're going to try and push that particular viewpoint on you as a, as a visitor of that website. So sometimes um, not infrequently they're biased and so that's something you want to think about when you're doing research all right uh, so let's finish this little section up who is the author of the article usually that information can be found near the title of the article you should also look for the author's bio many reputable publications will give a short explanation of who the author is and what their credentials are can often be found at the end of the article or after following a link from their name. And last is... So when you're looking at the author, uh, one thing you can do to help yourself out is you can go and you can Google that author. You know, you want to ask yourself, is this person an expert in the field? You know, like they're, they're writing about the Civil War. Are they, I mean, there's really two ways that they can, they can have reliability as an author. One is they can be an expert in the field. They, they're a professor or they work at a university in the history department, um, something like that. 
uh, or two, they work for a news organization and they've written a lot of articles about a lot of the different things and therefore, you know, they've got a history of reporting um, the honest truth and they've interviewed people who are, um, you know, uh, authoritative sources. Because why do we care what Joe Nobody says about this? We don't. He's not an expert. Just because somebody has an opinion doesn't make it an opinion that you want to quote in a research paper, right? You need to identify who the author is. And a lot of times uh, on web pages specifically, there's no author listed. It's just an organization that is the author. And sometimes that can work if the organization writing something is, say, the United States government or if it's on the web page of a um, university like the University of Virginia or Purdue University or, or something that is well known and recognizable, then oftentimes you can use it. But if it doesn't have an author and it's, it's just floating out there, it's, it's not credible. So we need to identify who the author is and then think about why we care what they have to say. Purpose. What is the purpose of a website? When you're on a website, consider the question, why does this site exist? If there are a lot of ads, or the site is only giving you a couple of sentences worth of information at a time before making you click next to read more, you can be sure that site's primary purpose is to make money from advertisements. So the information it offers is probably not reliable. If the author seems to be trying to convince you to buy something, or there's a prominent place in the site for you to put your credit card info, then it's likely the information is biased in favor of a product. That's true. So if you go to the library, and uh, I got to get out of here. Uh, let's go back here up, and back here. All right, and back to it. Um, you know, you can go through and you can you can ask your librarian for help if if you go to the library and you're looking for that. So again, let's let's break and think about it. What kind of sources um, can you find online that would be reliable sources? Uh, have a discussion with your facilitators in the classroom. Um, try and make a list of things that will help you as you go off and, and do your own research. So, and, and the video's right here. I'll, I'll link it um, so you can watch it again if you need to. So where can you find that information? Well, again, we've already talked about this. The two easiest sources for somebody who's homeschooled are the library, um, because it's not only does it have a lot of books, a lot of magazines, uh, some databases where you can look up journals and scholarly articles and things like that, but the library also has librarians and librarians, their job is to do this kind of stuff. And so if you can't figure out what you're looking for, ask them. They absolutely can get you the information you need. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, if the information is electronic, you can copy it and save it into a file and take it home with you and do your work from home. If it's in a magazine or a book, you can check that book out. If the book or the magazine is uh, a resource that has to stay in the library, you have a phone. You can take pictures of the pertinent pages and take them with you. Or you can copy them, just write them down. Uh, there's often a copy machine in the library, and you could even use that. So there's lots of um, avenues in the library to get information. Your other option is online. You have internet at your house, you can look things up online, but make sure to use that crap test to identify whether the information is valid or whether it's, um, you know, crap. So uh, moving on. You know, four, I find something that could be useful. What do I do? Well, read it or watch it if it's a documentary or, or whatever, but as you're reading it, keep in mind that you're looking for quotations that you can use in your paper. And so when you come across something that you think is important, that you think is useful to you, write it down. Uh, if it's from a, an online document, copy and paste it into a new blank document. If it's uh, in something that you're reading in paper, write it down in a blank document. You create a new document 
Uh, often I create one in Google Docs and I call it quotations uh, for you know whatever the title of paper is. And then whenever I find anything that I think is going to be useful to me, I write it down in this document and I have a whole list of all the quotations that I might use. Um, they're already in there. And then you know I can just sort of decide which ones I want to use and which, which ones I want to place where in in the essay as I write it and that's enormously helpful to me so do that uh, as you're as you're going through your sources because the worst thing is you're like oh yeah I remember reading something that'd be super helpful and then you don't remember what you read it in or where it was and what you read it in and you've got to go back and you've got to try and find it and oh what a pain uh, if you had just written it down at the time that you saw it you wouldn't have to worry about that anymore uh, so as you write things down, my suggestion, though, is to cite your sources. There's two ways to cite a source. There's what's called parenthetical citation, uh, and then there's the works cited page. And you have to do both for each source. So as you find a source and you think the source is going to be useful to you, um, the first thing you should do is start building a works cited page. Now, we're using uh, Modern Language Association citation, which is uh, MLA formatting. And the easiest way to write down an MLA formatted citation is to use a website called easybib.com. Here's the URL. You just click on that, uh, and it's going to bring you here. Hold on, it's, it's thinking. So basically, you can create citations. So if you click in there on Create Citations, it will help you do that. Let's OK, so what, what did we find? We were reading a book, OK? Um, and so we click on book and it asks for some information. Now, you can search for the book by title or by ISBN number. All books have an ISBN number in the front. So if you flip to the front page, you can find an ISBN number. Uh, but my book was, um, and I should have come prepared with a book that I could have typed in here. Uh, but I'm going to go with American... Uh, heritage. My fingers are too fat. H E R I heritage. Yeah, civil war because it's like one of the ones I remember seeing on my dad's shelf growing up. Um, and then I say go, and we'll see what happens. Um, search. It's thinking. One result found, the Civil War, uh, 2009. All right, well, let's say that's the one that's ours. Uh, we cite it. The Civil War, Test Press, 2009. And let's say that's the book that we were looking at. We hit Continue, and it gives us the author. We can verify it. Um, you know, you want to go through and you want to verify that all the information is, is correct, uh, and then you will complete the citation. And you want it to be an MLA-9, and that's fine. So we have, I think, everything we're looking for here. I wish this ad would just go away. There we go. Um, so it should create the citation for us. And I'm doing it on my phone, and I've only ever done it. Um, but this is how you do it. And then you can copy the citation and paste it into a document, and you have your MLA citation right there. So that's super handy. Um, generally speaking, let me get back to my... Um, those are the compare and contrast instructions. I want day three. Um, so once, once you've got your uh, works cited page citation, and we'll build a works cited page together later, you just want to have it for all the books that you're going to quote, you want to have it. So you want to copy and paste that into a document and just have it. We'll deal with them later. Um, you want to do parenthetical citation. So generally speaking, your parenthetical citation is the author's last name and the page number uh, for a book. So let's say um, you know I quoted that book and the, the author's last name was Canton. Um, the parentheses would be Canton, and I found it on page 78. Uh, Canton space 78. Those would be, it's called parenthetical citation because it's in parentheses. Um, and so you just put that at the end of your quotation and, and you're good to go. But again, we'll, we'll go over that a little bit more and show it to you later. But 
what you need to know is if you're getting your information from a primary document, a book, a journal, a newspaper, a magazine, anything that was printed, you just need the page number and the author's name to parenthetically cite. Uh, if what you're you need the article's name if it's if it's a newspaper article as well or the article title or you know if it's a magazine article so we'll we'll work on that but if it's a documentary we need the time so the runtime uh, when in the in the movie did it stop so if you're watching it on on a smart device you can hit pause and it has that little bar at the bottom of the screen and that tells you um, at what time, at what moment in the documentary or podcast or, or whatever it happens to be um, you're at and you want to write that moment down. And again, you're going to need the, the author's name. So whoever's speaking, whoever's the uh, person who put together um, the documentary. And so you've got to find that information as well. Uh, you'll need the title of the documentary or the title of the podcast as well. Um, and for websites, you need the website address so just copy and paste the website address for now um, and that will will do it and if you go to easybib.com it's going to ask you for most of this information and so it should be readily available if you can't find this kind of information then you have to question yourself is this a viable source um, if there's no author who is who's putting their name behind this uh, so these are some of the things that we think about, and I just want to send you off to do some research and to uh, start thinking about your topic and uh, reading more about it so that you understand it, um, and then hopefully we can talk more about this as time goes on. I know this is kind of a quick uh, video that just sort of goes over the basics. If you have questions, I'm around. Um, put a question in the feed on the on the webpage or send me an email, and I will be happy to answer those as best I can. And please. Um, you know, stop and have a discussion as a class about research topics and where to find them and what kinds of things you should be looking for, um, you know, before things are, are done. I know I'm not there with you, but hopefully, um, you know, Beth and Beth uh, will be able to do that and talk you through it and answer your questions. Thanks.